Well, good afternoon. This is Mark Skidmore. Um, I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, uh, you can see on your screen here that we have today's webinar, The Impact of the Opioid Crisis on Hospital, a Nurse's Perspective from the Bedside. Um, and then I would like to also note that we have a, an upcoming webinar in May, in May on the relationship between opioid prescriptions and child removals. Um, these are a part of our, excuse me, health and safety education grant. Um, this webinar series is called Combating Opioids, um, and this is done in conjunction with Purdue University. Um, today's uh, uh, webinar speaker is Dr. Nicole Adams. She is a clinical assistant professor at the Purdue School of Nursing and a Reagan Streif Center for Healthcare Engineering faculty affiliate. She's a Robert Wood Johnson nurse, Nursing and Health Policy Fellow. She has years of experience at the bedside in a hospital leadership in both Indiana and New Mexico. And she's here to talk with us about some of her ex experiences and background um, with the opioid crisis and how it's impacting hospitals. And so with that, I'll, in, I'll pass it on to Nicole. Nicole, thanks again for um, giving the webinar and sharing uh, with us all of this information. For the participants, um, you will see at the bottom, um, you'll have a chat option. If you have any questions or comments, you can just type it in there, and uh, Nicole or I will make note of it, and um, Nicole can answer it along the way or perhaps wait till the end. So with that, I'll pass it on to Nicole. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is probably going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks. It's not real heavy in research, but I'm going to kind of bring to my experience with working in hospitals, my experience I've had with research and working with communities with the opioid um, use disorder and working with people in recovery. And I have really learned a lot from those experiences that bring new light to what I've seen in the hospitals. So um, let's start off talking about statistics. I'm going to skip over the statistics about how many overdoses happen annually, what the rates are, the fentanyl issues, the issues with prescribing, because those are all kind of tangential to what happens in the hospital. So um, there is commonly reported data that comes out of hospitals, um, mostly through syndromic surveillance. So um, that's where you know reports are made and counted of how many times a certain disease process or diagnosis is made. There's a really good syndrome of surveillance in Massachusetts. It's called Chapter 55. It's named after the law that brought that database into being. And um, there's a link to it also I've provided if you'd like to go and look at that website. There, it's really interactive. They have really rich data, um, agreements with all the hospitals, coroners, pharmacies, to provide a lot of data so that they can really get a feel for what's happening with overdoses in their state. It's considered a gold standard. Um, Michigan, actually the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center uh, created a system called the SOS or the System for Opioid Overdose Surveillance and it's modeled a little bit after that Chapter 55 system. Um, it's only in two counties right now as far as I'm aware and they um, don't have the same completeness of data but what they have is the ability to look in a real time and see where overdoses are happening. So it kind of helps them focus resources, law enforcement, um, a kind of action into where those overdoses are most commonly occurring. In Indiana, we have the ESSEN project as well, which comes out of the Indiana Health Exchange, Information Exchange data um, that gives us some of the syndromic surveillance, but the data is not always complete in that data set, so it's kind of challenging sometimes to work with it, and it's not available for all counties. Um, internally, hospitals often count how many overdose patients they see, um, maybe how much Narcan is administered, which Narcan is the reversal agent um, for opioids, and maybe how many admissions happen uh, related to, which, uh, to opioids. Excuse me. Um, uh, reviewed some of the syndromic surveillance um, databases that are out there that are really robust. Um, Chapter 55 in Massachusetts is considered the gold standard of opioid surveillance. And I encourage everyone, I've provided the links um, to go look at those, uh, that database and that website and the kind of reporting and the kind of data analysis they're able to do to really see what's happening in their area. Um, so as far as data that's often not reported, not collected, less well known in hospitals, 
Um, patient violence against nurses and other staff. There's very limited research done on this in literature. I, I did a lit search looking for studies done in the US, and between 2013 and 2019, actually none published in 19, 18 was the last year that anything was published, there were 14. Um, and I found really two studies, and um, what those studies found is that violence is very underreported, and especially verbal violence and verbal abuse is considered part of the job, especially for emergency room nurses. And I can, I totally relate to that. Um, I was a night charge nurse in an ER where we saw a lot of um, psychiatric patients, a lot of um, uh, substance use patients, and the verbal abuse and physical threats were just part of my daily routine. So much so that it changed the way I reacted to patients. And after I left the ER and was in the ICU for about six months, I was working with a challenging family and I realized how much nicer I was to them. And I think a lot of ER nurses have this kind of realization once they leave that environment, especially if it's a really high-paced, fast-paced ER, that, um, that they, they change as people in that environment. So the other thing that often is not well um, recorded are you know, calls to security. Um, they may be recorded how many times security is involved, but not necessarily why. Is it a patient related to substances? Is it something else? Um, agitated patients are often, you know, we call rapid response teams often come and become involved with trying to calm patients. And they may, again, track how many times they respond, but not necessarily the diagnosis they're responding to. Um, conflict with families. You know, we often think about what the patient does, but we never document what the family's done, or rarely document that. And so it's, it's, that's something that's often not tracked. And um, families can be a big problem, you know, uh, add to that agitation and that anxiety and that abuse. And lastly, often not really well tracked, in, in my experience, are staff attitudes. So there's a, there can be a lot of burnout and turnover. Um, nurses become compassion fatigued. It's very easy um, when you're working with these populations to become very jaded and um, look down on people. And especially when we have high utilizers and you're working in an emergency room and you say the same people repeatedly for the same thing, it, it's easy to lose track of what your purpose is and why you chose this profession. So let's talk a little bit about these ER patients. So um, for the opioid overdoses, our standard routine of care, those of you that are health professionals will recognize this, we give them Narcan, the reversal agent, we monitor them, and we rarely admit them. Um, we should be doing um, a, a standard of care of doing a screening, a brief intervention, and a referral to treatment, which we call SBIRT. However, that referral to treatment is often lacking. There's a national shortage of psychiatric care, there are a few primary care doctors who have adopted um, prescribing Suboxone that requires a special um, DEA waiver in order to do that. And Suboxone alone is not enough. It has to be paired with wraparound services, behavioral therapy. So that shortage of having access to that care makes it difficult to do really good referrals for people. Seeing the same patient, um, again, back to that compassion fatigue, seeing the same patient every day and not being able to help them. I've talked to many nurses and first responders who have just become so negative towards patients with substance use disorder because I think the frustration of not being able to really get them to a better place adds to their loss of compassion. And then, um, and you know, we have those people who are there all the time, and it's, it's just hard to do that. I think there's a lack of understanding of substance use disorder that also compounds that um, issue with that compassion. Um, there's other drugs people come in on, not just opioids, and often if they're combined with opioids, it creates a bigger challenge. Often methamphetamines are, many people believe if they use methamphetamine with their opioid, they won't stop breathing and they can take a higher dose, which is not true. So uh, you wake people up and then the methamphetamine takes over and that's a stimulant that makes them very aggressive and very strong. You know, often we talk about patients that are like Superman when they're on methamphetamine. Um, spice, you know, we've seen patients that have that zombie-like appearance. They're also very aggressive and difficult to manage. Um, marijuana comes in with, um, amphet or with uh, opioids all the time, as, as does alcohol. And withdrawal from alcohol is life, can become life-threatening and is often an, an, a reason we admit patients. But the co-occurring um, substance use of opioids and alcohol 
can make it more challenging to address the needs of the patient. So and then lastly, I'm going to talk about drug seekers. You'll see I have it in quotes because it's not really how we should be referring to patients, but it's where we get often when we see people many times. Many times people will come in seeking a high. They may be looking for opioids for that, or they may be coming in seeking opioids to avoid withdrawal. Um, one of the street names for withdrawal is super flu because it, it feels like you have the flu times 100. So somebody who's withdrawing may come to the emergency room just looking to get rid of that horrible feeling. Often they come in with vague complaints and, and of pain with no confirmation of anything wrong through testing. And so that becomes a challenge to try and address that patient then. Uh, the prescription drug monitoring programs, or PDMPs, in, in Indiana, ours is called INSPEC. And those have really helped physicians in the ER manage those patients that they don't know that come through to see are they going to every hospital in town, are they traveling the state to get opioid prescriptions. So it's really limited that. The challenge with those is if they're integrated in the EHR, it's really easy. Um, I've worked in the system where we did that and you clicked a button and the patient's prescribing history came up. So as a nurse, if I was concerned, I could print that and provide it to the physician as part of my assessment. When the PDMP is outside of the EHR, it requires that busy emergency room physician to move away from their charting and their work into a different system, log in. If that system's running slow that day, it can really create a challenge to be able to be judicious in checking those um, PDMPs. So um, there's another kind of emergency group patient that is challenging as well, and those are the patients that are opioid dependent and chronically ill. So the opioid dependent patient may or may not have opioid use disorder. They can develop dependence after long-term use of even moderate doses. Um, often these patients have chronic illnesses like COPD, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, which causes horrible neuro uh, neuropathy pain in their extremities, um, congestive heart failure, or chronic back pain. And these patients can often be elderly. We don't know, we often can with uh, mistake withdrawal if they are altered. So a patient comes in and they're confused, they may be slurring their words, and we immediately think they're having a neurological event. But um, we don't think about, is this patient dependent on opioids and are they experiencing sy symptoms of withdrawal? And then that patient that's altered, we won't give them opioids because we don't want to further sedate them. And so it's often a challenge. I have an experience in a hospital where in our med surge unit, we had a patient who had had a stomach flu and did not take their oxycodone for two days, and they had been on it for over 10 years. So uh, following that, taking that, they became very confused, um, very agitated and anxious, as well as having extreme abdominal pain and vomiting. So their family brought them in, and we um, couldn't find anything initially, but in the middle of the night, this patient had this crisis moment of hypertension and, and extreme confusion and agitation. And so we ended up giving sedatives to try and calm the patient a little bit, but not opioids. And the next day the patient had a procedure requiring sedation, which they gave fentanyl, which is an opioid. And the patient came back from their procedure completely clear, lucid, comfortable, no pain, looking great. By 3 a.m. that morning, completely decompensated again because withdrawing once again. We just don't think of opioid withdrawal in grandma or grandpa, and so we often miss that. The other class of patients that can be challenging in the ER are the opioid dependent with an acute injury. So pain specialists call this acute on chronic pain. Um, if they're already on significant doses of opioids to manage their chronic pain, you can't really go higher to address an acute injury like a car accident or a broken leg. We can try alternatives. Um, we have NSAIDs, which are like ibuprofen and naproxen. And we have IV forms of those, but they don't act as quickly and they don't act in the same way that opioids do for acute pain. Um, we also have tried using, and some hospitals will use ketamine as an alternative pain management, but that is not a take-home medication, and that is something that nurses have to be specially trained and watching how to, and protocols have to be built on using ketamine in patients. It's not as easy as, as an opioid naive patient receiving a little bit of opioid for an uh, injury. The other issue we have with opioid dependence is one of the leading therapies for opioid use disorder is 
uh, opioid replacement therapy with Suboxone or Methadone. Now, Suboxone has a very strong bond to the mu receptor and will not be kicked out by other opioids like fentanyl. So a patient who's on Suboxone, it does nothing to give them an opioid. Um, a patient who's on methadone, now that can be kicked out by some, but not others, uh, but it could also cause precipitous withdrawal in doing that. And lastly, Vivitrol is not a, a opioid, but a blocker of that new receptor. So it keeps other opioids from coming in. And uh, it, they advise people who are on Vivitrol injections to carry a card so first responders know that those opioids will not work because that bond is also very strong. So I'd like to talk now a little bit about the hospitalized patient, which is a little different than the ER patient. So again, admissions are usually not very common uh, with overdoses unless there's another medical condition or they have more substances or polysubstance abuse um, and something else is happening. Our more common case is that dependent and chronically ill patient, and we may face some pain management issues. Again, we may withhold opioids and get uh, and miss that they're withdrawing from opioids as, as their primary cause of some of their issues. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I talked about that patient we had that, you know, we just didn't even, it, it wasn't even a thought that this might be the cause of their issue. So uh, withdrawal is, you know, agitation, anxiety, diarrhea, vomiting, horrible abdominal pain, runny nose, they can have high blood pressure, all kinds of symptoms that look like other things as well, so it may not be recognized. And we often treat with sedatives like benzodiazepines, which include drugs like Ativan and Valium, or antipsychotics and Benadryl to sedate patients and calm them. Sometimes if we keep patients long enough and we withhold their opioids and we put them using these other medications, get them all the way through withdrawal, now we've detoxed them and they have no opioids in their system. The challenge is that we haven't really addressed any of their cravings, we haven't really connected with why they were misusing opioids in the first place, and we've taken their tolerance. So now we send them out of the hospital with no tolerance, and if they return to their previous doses, they're at a very high risk of overdose. Um, I have not worked in a system where we've counseled patients on that. Um, we have well-established protocols for withdrawal from alcohol. We use um, CIWA commonly which is for um, a measure for nurses to assess the level of withdrawal of the patient for alcohol and then a titration dose of medication to intervene. We have something called CALS, which is the opioid withdrawal scale, and it works similar to that. It can be used paired with Suboxone um, to address withdrawal symptoms and make people very comfortable and start them, maybe even engage them down the path to recovery. Um, so any provider can prescribed for Suboxone in the hospital. It does not require that special DEAX waiver. It's only required to prescribe outside of that inpatient setting. However, we don't see a lot of um, hospitals. We have a handful of hospitals that I know of nationally that are starting to use the cows and starting to induct people in the hospital on Suboxone, but it's not really widespread everywhere. It's not something that people have learned about in school up to this point. And so there's not a lot of training or comfort with it on either the prescriber side or the nurse side. Um, you know, I've not seen CALS implemented in any of the hospitals I've worked in. So that is a challenge on getting everybody up to speed on those education pieces. Lastly, I want to talk about the, the hospitalized patients, the problems we have with discharge. Often patients who are opioid users may come in with some kind of severe infection due to the, especially if they're injecting drugs and require 12 weeks of antibiotic therapy. That's usually not done in the hospital. It's usually a, an at-home thing. You get a peripherally inserted IV catheter or a PICC line, and you do your antibiotics yourself. Your family helps you with it, or a home health nurse will come and administer your antibiotics. The big challenge there is that you have somebody who's an IV drug user, and you can't really send them out with a direct line to inject drugs in. So that creates challenges of, are we going to pull them in skilled nursing? Are we going to keep them in the hospital? Is there an, an oral medication we can send them on instead? And really hospitals acknowledging that this is a real issue and they have to assess their patients for, can they take a pick line home? What is their social setting? Are they, is it a safe idea to do that? So next I'd like to talk about visitors in the hospital because these visitors can also pose some challenges. 
Um, 10 years ago, in working in the ICU, I had to explain to patients' families that they didn't need to bring heroin, heroin in for their loved one. They were not going to withdraw because we had them on fentanyl, and fentanyl was better than heroin. Today, we have to secure those fentanyl drips to keep patients' family members from stealing out of them. Um, it's just because everybody's become aware of what fentanyl is. But um, families have brought in drugs um, to, to patients in my experience. Um, you also have the situation of when a family member becomes a patient. Often, um, opioid use disorder and substance use disorder is not limited to one person in the family. It may be something that many people do. It may be something they do together as a family. And so when the family comes to visit, if they use in the presence of their loved one, they may actually overdose. And when the family member overdoses in the bathroom, they become a patient themselves. And it, it creates a lot of, um, a lot of chaos on the unit. It's a disruptive event and it's challenging when you're not prepared to have to face that kind of event to work it into, into everything and keep the unit calm and keep other patients calm. Um, the other thing is when there's violence on the unit, those, you know, in the hospital it's supposed to be a calm, healing place and it's a challenge when you have uh, violence on the unit. Um, increased needs for security in inpatient units and waiting rooms to deal with family as well as patients when patients become, if they begin to withdraw and become aggressive or agitated. So in conclusion, I think that we have a lot of challenges. There are some great bright spots. I'm very, very hopeful that we're starting to turn in our direction as we approach all these issues. You know, there's a stated 17 year gap between research to practice. And so there's a slow adoption of new things that are coming out and bright spots as, as we're moving. I think there's greater intensity in changing things related to opioids because everyone recognizes what a big issue it is and that it affects everyone. And we need to you know, continue to focus on how do we bring this knowledge and education to nurses and doctors that are in the hospitals and working with people with substance use. And, um, and, and lastly, just everyone needs to recognize why we're here in the first place and, and find ways to combat compassion fatigue as well as recognizing that um, those people are us. Everyone knows someone that has a substance use disorder and struggles with it and so it kind of helps me to reframe my approach when I think of that. Thank you very much for listening and um, I'd be happy to, to uh, take any questions or answer anything you might have. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box, one by me and one by Stephanie. We could start there if you'd like. And then for sure. the participants, please go ahead and type in questions or comments that you may have. That'd be great. So I'll just jump back to your question first, Mark, earlier. I see there, how many days does it take to detox from opioids? It depends on the person, um, three to seven days usually for full detox. Um, and then how can we support and educate family members coming to the hospitals about OUD? That's, that's a real challenge. Um, I think part of it is a multifaceted approach. We, um, let me think on this one. It's really hard because on one hand, you have people that are receiving prescriptions for opioids and they need to be aware of some of the risks associated with those. They need to be aware of why their doctor may not be giving them opioids anymore. Um, one of the challenges we have is the withdrawal off of opioids when physicians stop prescribing. And so that, that can be a real challenge. Um, the other thing is, is really, we have not adapted to doing assessments of families um, for hospitalized patients. And of, you know, is this a single person in the family that's using opioids? Is this a substance use disorder that runs through the whole family? Do we need to involve the whole family in this? Is the family here supporting the patient stopping the use of opioids or are they um, encouraging it? And so it's just something that's so challenging without referral resources. And I think that's our biggest challenge is really working through communities. And this is a lot of the work I do in my research is working with communities to build these networks 
to build these bridges from the hospital to treatment so that um, there is a place to send people and, and not just send them with a list of phone numbers, but a warm handoff and this, this is where you get help. Nicole, you, you mentioned uh, compassion fatigue several times. Um, what do what do people in the healthcare arena do to recover from that? Find a way to back off so that you can refresh yourself. Well, that it's. I have to say, unfortunately, in my experience, it's generally up to people to recognize it in themselves. And it often comes after a change of venue. They often just feel burnt out. They don't recognize that it's compassion fatigue necessarily in their early careers. As uh, I think as nurses move through their careers, as they gain years of experience, they start to become more reflective. And they start to really think about their actions and why they're there. But it's something that we, I know we do teach about at Purdue in our nursing program, and we do, um, teach our students that they need to be thinking about being reflective and about, you know, evaluating how they're feeling about the care they're providing and the patients they're caring for. Thank you. Stephanie also has another question. So will nursing school start teaching to this issue now that it has reached crisis status nationwide? Um, so it is, I think some faculty are incorporating it. I don't think that there's any mandates that I know of. Or, um, or general pushes. I do work, um, another research project I have going is we are assessing the, um, what's being taught in Indiana nursing schools um, to try and determine at least a baseline of where are we. Are we covering our bases or do we need to augment it? What would you say to someone who has been prescribed opioids and is afraid to take them? I would be very frank in my conversation about what are their fears, why are they being prescribed the opioids, is there an alternative, and quite honestly, in the ER, if a doctor writes for opioids, which I can tell you, I currently practice in the ER, and I rarely see prescriptions for opioids. I think in, you know, two months, I probably hand out one or two prescriptions for opioids at the most. Now, I don't work that frequently, so, but I just, we, they've just really curtailed that prescribing. So if the patient is receiving them, I tell them, only take it if you really need it. You may want to stick with it just taking one before you go to bed so that you can sleep and rest. You do need rest to heal, um, but if you can manage on other medications without needing this, then that's fine too. And often, um, uh, people will find that they are relieved with other medications, but for things like kidney stones, that pain can be so excruciating, there really isn't anything other than an opioid to help get through the passing of that kidney stone. And so it's really a lot of coaching and counseling and, and working with people so that you can understand why they're afraid and also um, offer them alternatives and, and the, the opioids are the last option. And then, do you know of resources that address how to keep drugs coming into and being used in the hospital, i.e. security and clinical collaboration policies? So I do not. I know I worked at um, one hospital that was considered an inner city hospital. Um, we did have only one way in and one way out at night. And security, you had to check in with security as you came in. That didn't really stop the flow of drugs coming in. Um, we had to still monitor it as nurses to watch and just be cognizant of what families were doing at the bedside with their loved ones. Um, I know that the issue of um, metal detectors for security purposes is um, has very a lot of challenges. It really depends on local um, state and local laws surrounding the use of that kind of security measure. But it's it's really kind of one of those things that everyone does their own thing and there hasn't i haven't seen anything really of best practice of how do you make people feel like the hospital is a safe place but at the same time ensure that it is a safe place because often people don't feel safe if they have to walk through metal detectors are just patted down when they're walking in mm.
Well, I don't see any other uh, chat questions coming in. Um, no one's typing. Um, while we're waiting for just a few more minutes uh, for the audience, it would be great if we could get your feedback. You can see a few questions on the screen. Please take a moment and fill that out. That's very helpful for us. Um, well, Nicole, thank you very much for giving us this perspective and the challenges at the hospital <laughs> with regard to um, uh, working with people with opioid use disorder. Um, I was, I guess I, I understood this implicitly, but I was surprised um, when you mentioned the families and how the families can actually be also involved and that can exasper exacerbate. I always sort of think of them as being a support, but that's not always the case. Right. How, how often is it the case where the family itself is um, a, a major difficulty? Um, it depends. I have to say it really depends on the unit and it depends on the hospital. I, it just varies uh, broadly based on the community that they're, they're based in. Um, what I see, what I've seen most commonly recently is uh, a chronically ill older person whose family is stealing their opioids. And when the family member, when that older person is hospitalized, the family becomes very concerned about their supply of opioids. And that is really hard to tease out. And it's, it's not part of nursing care. It's not part of hospital care. But it really impacts the whole environment of caring for that patient in the room when this is kind of hanging in the shadows that they're, they're so concerned about making sure they have enough opioids when they go home. Yeah. Well, I think this is a good place to stop for today. Um, Tessa Garrow says, thank you, Dr. Adams, and I also thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, we really appreciate, again, Nicole, the information you've provided. And um, so we'll sign off for now. Uh, and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye.